sao in ring shring ka e la ring asang ka hala ring ta ka la ring sao ain kling ring shring Namaste. So I'm in my uh, villa <laughs> in Sri Lanka on working vacation. And I'd like to talk about consciousness and the different chakras. So, you know, we have quite a background of looking into consciousness and its different aspects, and especially its development and how we attain enlightenment. So looking at consciousness from the point of view of the chakras is uh, very enlightening <laughs> because we have seven chakras and we can't pretend that we don't have all those seven chakras. So when people try to approach spiritual life and they want to confine it to the upper chakras only, they get in trouble because then they have to deny part of themselves that's just as real or unreal. <laughs> because the division of the self into seven is itself illusory. Huh? What to speak of the existence of the individual self itself? Words. Anyway... <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about these views that we get through the seven chakras, starting with the sex chakra. The sex chakra evaluates and measures everything by whether or not or how much it contributes to its lusty desires. So when we see someone, there's an immediate calculation, oh, how would this person be in bed? Huh? We could call this crotch consciousness. <laughs> well, men have a saying for it, thinking with the small head. <laughs> so that head is very dumb. And if we follow the promptings and urgings of the sex center, we always get ourselves in trouble. Huh? Isn't it? Isn't that everybody's experience? It always leads to difficulty. Why? Because we're prioritizing one chakra over all the others. And it happens to be the, the most stupid one. <laughs> so that only leads to problems. Then there's the energy chakra, the Dantian, as the Chinese call it. This chakra measures everything by effort. How much effort will it be to do this or to do that? And how much of my energy budget would I have to invest? And so on, these kind of thoughts. So the energy chakra is a more sophisticated awareness and it's better at strategizing and like I said, budgeting the energy to achieve different outcomes. So by, by means of the energy chakra, we can calculate or even predict how much energy it's going to cost to accomplish our, our goals. Then there's the movement chakra. And the movement chakra measures everything by uh, the harmony or the rhythm of movements. Huh? Drumming comes from the movement chakra. And the people who are into drum, well, among musicians, drummers are always known as being kind of dumb, right? <laughs> but without the drummer, everybody loses the beat. So, drummer is very important. But the drummer is limited. See, the, the first three chakras, sex, energy, and movement, are kind of like the animal. They're the animalistic part of the human being. So, you know, other animals like dogs and cats and like that, they're 
first, they are only the first three chakras. See, they don't have much in the way of emotions and very little in the way of cognition. <laughs> and their expression is also very limited. Or they are conscious. They definitely are conscious, but that consciousness can only express itself through the functions of what in a human being are the first three chakras. So the first three chakras are the animalistic part of the human being. They're absolutely necessary for maintaining the body. I mean, after all, the Kundalini Shakti resides in the Muladhara chakra. This is given in the scriptures. So why is she there? Huh? Because she is the life energy and the life is procreated through the sex center. So this goddess, huh, who is the one who breathes for us when we're asleep and who regulates the metabolism and uh, appetite and digestion and elimination, all of the very necessary functions of the body so that we don't have to. Huh? We can be free to do higher human things. And what are they? Well, let's look at the heart chakra. Heart chakra, of course, deals with emotion. So the heart chakra measures everything, comparing it to what we might call the ideal emotion. Everybody has a core emotion, and this is called the Adi Rasa, right? And it has to do with love, sex, and affection. But it also has to do with how one sees oneself in the world, what role one is playing. And of course, the Vedic culture divides the human society into four occupational divisions. The Brahmanas, whose primary concern is religion, self-realization. The Kshatriyas, whose primary concern is power and administration. The Vaishyas, whose primary vision centers on production of resources, especially food, and trade, economics. And then there's the Shudras, who don't really have any direction of their own, and they simply have to follow the other higher, higher um, castes. Well, Varnas is the proper word. So we see these four kinds of people everywhere. Actually, the Shudras are more than 95% well, these days, probably more like 99% of the population. And of course, in Western society, the whole thing is just skewed by the materialism. So even people with Brahminical capacity wind up doing mundane things, you know, like business administration. Everybody's getting dragged down the org chart. You know, this is the problem. And it's because of the uh, lack of awareness of the transcendental nature of consciousness. But we'll get to consciousness in a minute. The next one is the throat chakra. Now, the throat chakra is how we express ourselves. And it is a center of conflict between the heart chakra and the forehead chakra, the agnya chakra, now, the intellect. So the intellect wants to express itself through the throat chakra, and so does the heart. So who's going to win? <laughs> There's always a struggle there. And the next one, the Agnya Chakra, is the seat of the intellect, intelligence, cognition, thought. Huh? So this is how we evolve our ideas. And of course, when we finally get to meditation, this is how we implement that concentration on a transcendental object. What is that transcendental object? Well, that is found in the crown chakra. And the crown chakra is the center of consciousness awareness, and of course, reality, <laughs> self-realization. So when we can really understand the function of these seven chakras, we understand that we are at every moment acting through one or more of them. We can't avoid it because this is our existence. So just like the people who are into the lower three chakras suffer because they reject and neglect the functions of the higher chakras, though the people who are into religion 
and philosophy and stuff like that suffer uh -huh, and are limited by their rejection of the lower th chakras. You see, nobody is taking the human being as a whole. Everyone is pretending to be something only partial. But that doesn't make it so. <laughs> you see, so the uh, religious people and the materialists are both simply partial. And that's why neither one can defeat the other. And they argue back and forth and it's interminable. <laughs> It'll never end. The only people who are actually uh, victorious are the transcendentalists. The real transcendentalists, because they accept the human being as a whole. That, yes, we have these animal desires and needs. You know, if we don't eat, how can we meditate? If we don't take care of the body nicely, how can we function, you know, to, to do all the other higher things? So this is why, you know, like, too much austerity or too much thinking, you know, are, are bad for us. Really, the center of our being is the heart. The heart has to be happy. The heart has to be pleased. And how does that happen? When we pursue the taste, the rasa, that is dear to our heart. And of course, that's a very elaborate subject matter, but briefly there are five major rasas, and they are uh, neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. So these five rasas are constantly at play within the heart. And, of course, one of them is going to be our favorite. Everybody has their favorite, you know. Some people are just like natural friends or natural parents. Or, in the in, uh, case of many people, their center of emotional life is their love life. <clears throat> But we find that, uh, actually, many people are happy when they're in a position of servitude. They don't have to think about what to do. <laughs> it's easy life. So there are a lot of people who are in that service mood. And then there are the people who are detached, neutral. You know, the, the monks and the meditators and people like that. They're trying to attain neutrality, equanimity, like that. So these different rasas are the ideal that the heart holds dear. And this is the way we achieve happiness, is by acting out the roles of these rasas, uh, the ones that we hold most favored in our hearts. So this is the thing. At every moment, these seven chakras and their different views of life are vying for attention. Huh? They're, di they're different needs, and they're often conflicting needs. So this is the problem of life, huh? that there are all these views happening all the time within consciousness. And uh, we have to choose, or we think we choose. Actually, it's, it's destiny. But we have to choose between one and another because sometimes they're in conflict. So the way to handle this, of course, is to step back, <laughs> step back from the body, view the seven chakras as co-equal. They're all important. Every one of them has important needs that cannot be denied without compromising our energy and our existence in some way. So, so our approach, the Dharmasar approach, huh? is to practice the yogas that support and develop these chakras more or less simultaneously. Now, obviously, if there's a conflict of interest between the different chakras, we can't do them all at the same time. Uh -huh. But what we can do is a lot, a portion of our time and energy to taking care of each of them so that none of them are neglected that's the important point. Over time, over you know years, months and years of time, we want to make sure that all the chakras get their due.
And there are different uh, seasons in life when development of the different chakras is more or less appropriate. We have to take that into account too. For example, fully developing the sex chakra is best done in youth, the late teens and early 20s. And if we miss that opportunity, then it becomes more and more difficult later on to correct any imbalance in the sex chakra. So that should be done early. And then developing meditation and so on like that generally comes later on in life. But the habits that support it should be developed as early as possible uh, so that the meditation doesn't become lost doesn't become crowded out by other competing desires. And especially so that we realize very early in life and plan for the inevitable uh, retreat from life uh, that comes at the end of life and uh, develop the habit of meditation so that we have some place to go. Huh? We have to know or uh, develop or realize our destiny in the next life and very early on start to plan for that start to make a, a boat to carry us across the river of death uh, the viraja river and take us to the other side what is the other side the next body the next life the next existence uh, so once we take care of all these things see the animal needs faith in something higher you know just like a dog a dog needs a master and if he's not a member of a dog pack he looks to a human master so the dog needs somebody to tell him what to do otherwise he's just you know confused and lost so similarly the lower chakras need the heart chakra to give them a religion to give them a deity a faith, a direction. Now, of course, the Agnya Chakra, the mind, is full of doubts. That's mind for you, you know. So the mind is going to say, ah, this religion, this God stuff, you know, this is all just an illusion. You're just an imagining it, you know, and like that. But the heart needs to be uh, or have a deity. The heart needs to have a rasa a love, a mood, a center to direct its faith and its love. Otherwise, the heart feels lost, you see? And so, of course, the crown chakra knows that actually none of this is real. <laughs> none of this exists at all. It's simply a dream. So these different chakras have to be allowed to be in their own space and given the things they need in order to flourish. So it's okay that we can have a religion. In other words, we can have a heart, a love towards a deity, and then give that religion to our lower chakras to keep them happy. And at the same time, we can have a healthy skepticism in our intellect and try to meditate on emptiness and these kind of things because that's what's good for the mind. And finally, the realization that we are nothing but pure awareness. This is the crown chakra. You know, this is the perfection of life. This is self-realization. So we have to take care of all these chakras in a balanced way. And that is the secret of success of the Dharmasar method. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.